BJ Penn has achieved one of the most spectacular falls from grace in the history of combat sports. A string of losses inside and outside the octagon, in addition to rumours of substance abuse and other issues, have led to his reputation being at an all-time low. Nevertheless, for parts of his career, he was seen as the most skilled fighter in the sport, becoming a champion in the lightweight and welterweight divisions, despite having a frame most naturally suited to the featherweight division. In this video, I'm going to go through an overview of the techniques that made him a success. First though, to go through a recap of his career. After becoming the first American to win the Mundell's BJJ World Championships, BJ Penn made his professional MMA debut in the UFC training with and impressing at the time UFC champion Frank Shamrock Penn was along with Vitor Belfort the most hyped prospect the sport had ever seen and BJ Penn has has what you call Frank natural power absolutely he just, he's one of those, you punch you punch you punch some people got power and some people don't this kid has got power BJ in the mount is just a bad idea Penn would follow his debut with brutal knockouts of respected contender Dean Thomas and former Shuto champion and UFC number one contender Carl Uno before coming into a bout with Jens Pulver, at the time the UFC lightweight champion. After a nervous start in the second round, Penn would have success taking down and mounting Pulver. Penn would eventually secure an armbar. The tap would come, but it would be after the bell. In the second half of the fight, Penn would start to fade as Pulver started to take over. A left hand in the fifth round would stun Penn, helping Pulver to take home a close but not controversial decision. Penn would rebound from his loss to Pulver with the win over Paul Crichton and a close decision win over Matt Serra. He would then fight once again for the USC lightweight title with a match with Carl Uno. Going into the fight after his earlier win, Penn was a heavy favourite. When the action began, Penn dominated proceedings, passing Uno's guard at will and looking like a world champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. However, Uno refused to quit and go down easily. In the later rounds, Penn would gas badly. Uno would struggle to mount much in the way of offence, but he would score points. The fight would end in a controversial draw. In the wake of the fight, some were impressed with Penn's early skill, but many others were disappointed with his performance in the later rounds. To his detractors, Penn was starting to look like the second coming of Vitor Belfort, a fighter with a lot of potential who was squandering his talent. In the wake of the fight, the UFC would scrap the lightweight division for the time being, and Penn would next fight in his hometown of Hawaii. His opponent, Takanori Gomi, had been talked about as a potential super fight. However, he lost his most recent fight before Penn, making his record going into the fight 14-1. and During the fight, Penn would dominate before submitting Gomi in the third round. It was the best win of his career, and at that time, few would argue he was the number one lightweight in the world. For his next fight, Penn would face dominant UFC welterweight champion Matt Hughes. At the time, Hughes had a similar aura to Khabib now, Known for his incredible physical strength and walking around between fights at lean 190 pounds, few gave Penn much of a chance given that he wasn't cutting weight to make the lightweight limit. To close the UFC 45 broadcast, when he was asked of Penn's chances in the bout, Joe Rogan would say, quote, There's a guy who's going to get destroyed, end quote, in a rant where he said the fight shouldn't be happening. As part of his training for the fight, Penn would train with the esteemed Team Quest, who were regarded as the best wrestling camp in the sport at the time. As usual, the reports from training were legendary. They thought they were going to throw it around, and they were very, very truly impressed. Randy went on to say, at first he thought, big mix match, not so much anymore. So you had difficulty taking him down, even as big as you are, and he's 166 pounds. That, Absolutely. Wow. During the fight, Penn would finally properly realise the considerable hype behind him to a UFC audience. After stunning Hughes with some fast combinations, Hughes would rush a clinch where he would get taken down. After initially defending Penn's attempts to pass guard, he would eventually get hit with a big right hand. From there he would soon after tap to a choke. As a modern equivalent, the fight would be like Peter Yan moving up to lightweight and blowing Khabib out of the water in one round. 
or Alexander Volkanovsky moving up to welterweight and dominating Usman. After the win, Penn jumped to number one on the pound for pound list for all available MMA media rankings. Following a contract dispute with the UFC, Penn would then leave the organization to sign to fight with the K1 promotion. To many fans, Penn faced a disappointing level of opposition in the K1 promotion, coming into fights out of shape. However, to some fans, he put on the most legendary performance of his career in facing future UFC light heavyweight champion Leo Tumashida in the heavyweight division. Mashida was still developing, but he had already throttled former UFC champion Rich Franklin in a heavyweight bout, and also UFC contender Stefan Bonner. Over three rounds, Penn would hold his own against Mashida, and arguably win one round on points. After his run in the K1 promotion, Penn would return to UFC, where he would face George St. Pierre in a bout to determine the number one contender at Worldway. In the first round, Penn would dominate St. Pierre repeatedly beating him to the punch and landing a very stiff jab. BJ is unscathed and George St. Pierre is bleeding all over the place. George St. Pierre's face is busted up. Really bad already. St. Pierre would change tactics at the start of the second round, taking Penn down. He would take Penn down again in the third round. By the end of the fight, both guys looked exhausted, but St. Pierre had edged out the final two rounds making him a deserved winner in the majority of people's eyes. Though St. Pierre had earned a title shot, his shot would be postponed as he would suffer a groin injury in training. Penn would step in in St. Pierre's place and face Matt Hughes for the welterweight title at UFC 63. Going into the bout, Hughes had restored much of, if not all of the aura that he had held going into their first match at UFC 46. He had finished his last four opponents in the first round, submitting St. Pierre amongst others. Penn would once again be a difficult matchup for Hughes. Stuffing his takedowns and landing power punches on the feet, Penn would dominate the first round. In the second round, Hughes would finally get Penn to the ground, however he wouldn't fare much better there than on the feet. After missing an elbow, Hughes would have his back taken by Penn, who would transition to a triangle nearly submitting Hughes. There will be some controversy as to what would happen at the start of the third round. According to Penn, he suffered an injury at the end of the second round and was barely fit to continue. According to his detractors, he was gassed out. Whatever the reason, Hughes secured a dominant position and would force a stoppage. Despite losing to Hughes, being seen in the matchup as a David against a Goliath, Penn's spirited performance at the start of the bout would earn him a new level of celebrity than he had previously experienced with the sport also increasingly growing in popularity. After working as rival coaches on a season of The Ultimate Fighter, Penn would next face Jens Pulver in a rematch of their USC 35 title fight. Penn would dominate the fight from start to finish. Having generally been a fan favourite for much of his career, Penn would start to polarise fans when he would let go of the final submission late. He would next fight Joe Stevenson for the vacant lightweight title which had been vacated after Sean Shirk tested positive for steroids. The fight would be a brutal bloodbath with Stevenson being submitted in the second round. Penn would next face Sean Shirk for the lightweight title. Sean Shirk had maintained his innocence since testing positive for steroids and it seems unbelievable looking back now but he had many supporters who thought his positive test was used to shoddy drug testing protocols. The fight became a brutal grudge match in the build-up, with Penn hounding Shirk over his alleged use of performance-enhancing drugs, and many fans accusing him of being an asshole for not letting it go. With hindsight looking back now, given the shockwave that Isada sent through the sport, I think you would have to be extremely naive not to think that Sean Shirk wasn't pharmaceutically enhanced. When the bout began, Shirk came out swinging trying to take Penn's head off. Penn looked conservative, as if trying to gauge Shirk's game plan. As the fight progressed and the expected takedowns from Shirk weren't forthcoming, Penn settled into a striking groove and started to take over with his jab. By the third round, Shirk was gassed out and beaten down. A flying knee from Penn would finish a beaten down Shirk. For his next fight, Penn would face George St. Pierre for the welterweight title and one of the most talked about and anticipated fights amongst hardcore fans in the history of the sport. Going into the fight, 
Penn made several comments to suggest its head had swelled to the size of a balloon. To the death. We're going to go to the death. I'm not going to stop. I'm waiting to die. I'm going to go. Serious, George. I'm going to go to the death. I'm going to try to kill you. Opting against traveling for training as he had done in the past, he instead opted to train in Hawaii. St. Pierre would fight conservatively through what would be a brutal one-sided beatdown, with Penn losing every minute of every round. Penn would retire between the fourth and fifth rounds, making a mockery of his earlier promise to go to the death. Having been humiliated against St. Pierre, Penn would hire controversial strength and conditioning coach Marv Marinovich. Marinovich was tutored by Dr. Michael Yesis, who I interviewed on this channel. Uh, I've always been fascinated by the Marv Marinovich. The, the guy that actually trained Marv, uh, Michael Yesis, yes. yeah, Y-E-S-S, Russian name. Ah. He's awesome. He's like 85 now or something. And if you want to get massively entertained by somebody, like he's a good one. Yeah. After coming through a training camp with Marinovich, Penn would next face Kenny Florian at UFC 101 in a defense of his lightweight title. In a very polished performance, Penn systematically took Florian apart before submitting him in the fourth round. Penn would next face Diego Sanchez in a defense of his lightweight title. Penn would once again dominate before a cut opened up on Sanchez's forehead would force the doctor to stop the fight. Penn would fight again another 11 times, going a total of 1-1-9. One, one, and nine. His demise would have been fanciful for even his staunchest enemies. A knockout of Matt Hughes and a slam against the dominant wrestler John Fitch were some of the few highlights from this streak. I am not going to focus on the losing streak too much here as I think it's freshest in people's minds. So having seen that on more than one occasion through his career he was ranked as the number one pound for pound fighter in MMA, what of the style he used to achieve this? In his prime he had a remarkably similar style to his rival of the time and another force on the pound for pound list, George St. Pierre. Both fighters looked to establish a jab. Both fighters favoured a double leg takedown and focused on leg attacks when trying to take their opponent down. Both fighters avoided fighting on their back at all costs, and though both fighters had moments of ground and pound, they both generally preferred to pass guard with their opponent on the ground. At a broad look, you could be left with the impression that this was the perfect style for the era. The only problem with that line of thinking was that Fedor Emelianenko, the other dominant fighter of the era, favoured none of these things. Launching huge bombs with limited setup on the feet, favouring upper body takedowns and looking for submissions off his back, he had a very different style to both Penn and St. Pierre. As a striker, Penn favoured a jab as he came into his prime. He would often throw the jab and then lean back out of the way by transferring his weight to his back leg along with some movement at the waist. He would also use an uppercut to force opponents to adopt a more upright stance, making them more susceptible to the jab. Penn rarely kicked, and the sum his striking is criticised for this. However, his striking defence, against both kicks and punches, was some of the best of his era. It was rare at the time to see fighters leaning back out of the way of head kicks, as opposed to blocking at the time. He also used parries effectively against Kenny Florian. He was particularly effective against checking inside leg kicks. He was decent against outside leg kicks, although he was more susceptible to these with his bladed boxing stance. As a takedown threat, Penn's go-to takedown was a double leg takedown. If the takedown didn't immediately come, he would often switch to a single leg and sometimes occasionally use trips to secure the takedown. Penn's skills with upper body, higher stance standing grappling were rarely seen though he did hear a reversal against Mashida and took down Jens Powell with a trip. Penn's takedown defence, as has been described elsewhere in the video, was legendary. However, the unorthodoxy of his wrestling style has been overstated in parts, particularly by Joe Rogan. Not to say that it wasn't unorthodox, but it wasn't some kind of one in a million never before seen style. A lot was made of him sprawling with one leg under him against Matt Hughes. Yet when you see Brock Lesnar sprawling, you also see the same position. PJ is sprawling oh, yeah. with one leg while the other one's tucked underneath it. That's crazy. Not to say that Lesnar isn't a great athlete for his size, but it does go to show that it's not that an unusual a position. Most of Penn's takedown defense involves solid wrestling fundamentals with balance being his X factor. What is unusual about Penn is that he didn't just have good balance on his feet. 
He also had good balance whilst posting on a knee or resting on a hip. To defend single legs, Penn generally focused on controlling the head, pushing it down and away from him. He also controlled the wrist and pummeled for underhooks where possible. Penn was rarely on his back in his career during his prime, and when he was, he often looked to stand up. To stand up, Penn sometimes used his technical stand up as is often the go to move in a typical BJJ class. He also used a slower move that would involve posting on a knee in a move that is of similar mechanics to a Turkish get up. Like all high level BJJ practitioners, Penn had very good core strength and core strength endurance. This enabled him to be a mobile target on his back, never lying with his back completely flat to the ground. It is this core and oblique strength which likely enabled him to dodge Matthew's elbows before eventually taking his back. Penn's side control escape against George St. Pierre is slash was often a common talking point due to the flexibility involved. To pass guard, Penn would often use some less common tactics. He would draw his opponent's legs off the centre line using a leg weave before coming back onto the centre line as he progressed to the mount. To pass half guard, most guys at the time were looking to secure a cross face and use a tripod to stack the opponent up and pass half guard. Penn would often use an underhook on the near side for balance and leverage before passing the half guard. Penn's mount from side control on Henzo Gracie is another move that often gets talked about a lot because of the flexibility involved. So on that note, I will conclude the video. I won't say that I hope people remember him for his prime and not his downfall because I don't know the man personally. Nevertheless, from a skills and technique standpoint, he was definitely correctly ranked as the number one pound for pound fighter at one point in his career. The contribution of his physical attributes to his technique also often gets overstated. To become the number one pound for pound fighter in the world, he undoubtedly had something of the hard working technician to him.